Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jen Bryan. I'm the executive director of the St. John's International Women's Film Festival, and I'm thrilled to be welcoming all these incredible panelists to join us today for our conversation. Uh, before we start, I just want to uh, celebrate the fact that we are all across the country, which is uh, another really wonderful thing. I wish I could be inviting you all to St. John's and we could celebrate in person, but this is the, the second closest thing. Um, so thank you again. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm here based in St. John's in Newfoundland, Labrador, um, and that is on the traditional territories of many diverse Indigenous groups. And I'd like to acknowledge with respect the diverse histories uh, and cultures of the Beothic, the Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. I'd like to now start and do a quick introduction. First up, we have Tracy Deer, a Mohawk filmmaker, who just also released the debut, or the debut feature film, right? Beans, which is, uh, We'll get into that, but Tracy, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I'm here representing Women in View. I'm just outside of Montreal, which is the traditional territory of my people, the Haudenosaunee Ganyagaha. Uh, in English, you would know us as the Mohawk people. I'm very, very happy to be here with all of you and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Next up, we also have Leslie and Coles. Welcome, Leslie. Hi, how are you? I'm in Vaughan, Ontario, just north of Toronto, and we're situated on the traditional territories and treaty lands, specifically of the Mississaugas, the New Credit, First Nations, as well as the Ashna uh, Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe of the Williams Treaty First Nations, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis Nation. Welcome. Also, so pleased to welcome Ella Cooper. Welcome. Hi everybody, I'm Ella Cooper coming from the same territories as Leslie Ann Coles and I give thanks to Tuckeronto um, and uh, Scarborough as my home and where Black Woman Film is based, so we are a national organization. Thank you. And also Karen Bruce, how are you? Nice to see you back. Hi everyone, I am also extremely upset that I am not currently in a room in St. John's with all of these women. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit Territory on which Toronto stands, which is where I am currently in the city of Toronto. Wonderful, and going further out west, Carol Ann, uh, Carol Whiteman, sorry, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Jen. I'm here, uh, a settler in the traditional land of the Coast Salish. Um, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam people, and I'm really grateful to be here talking about storytelling with you all today and, uh, and advancing um, the, the, the topic of equality and inclusion and diversity and all those great things that, that we've all been working towards for so long. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so getting back to that topic, it's uh, today I'm really excited to have all of you really representing uh, a fantastic sample of the incredible women's organizations working in our country, uh, both from film festivals uh, to industry organizations and doing really incredible work. I will say we're incredibly fortunate that in Canada there are so many leaders uh, in this field doing fantastic work and really pushing um, our work towards gender parity. So thank you for being a really uh, wonderful sample of that. So since we have so many different organizations that we're behind, I'd like to maybe dive in and we can just take a few minutes to talk about your specific organization and, and where you're coming at from this uh, conversation. So maybe we can start with you, Carol. Do you want to talk about a little bit about your role uh, with women in the director's chair and a little bit of history of that group? Oh, I, I'd be delighted. Thank you, Jen. So uh, Women in the Director's Chair is a nonprofit um, enterprise and initiative that was piloted a, a co-creation um, with the uh, collaboration of ACTRA, the Alliance of Canadian Cinema and Television Radio Artists, um, the BAMP Centre, and Women in Film and Television Vancouver. And it was piloted in 1997 um, after the um, close of Studio D. And it was uh, um, a response to 
the lack of opportunities for women at mid-career. There seemed to be at the time a lot of opportunities for emerging or, you know, um, aspiring. And uh, we, we just really wanted to make a dent in particularly feature film and television series. And uh, we wanted to create that space uh, for um, the addressing of sexual stereotyping as well. That's one of the reasons why ACTRA became involved. And, and so we piloted that um, program uh, at the BAMP Center. It has grown over the last almost 25 years to um, a year long enterprise of uh, offering professional development, mentorships, awards, and um, really the, uh, the exciting part is that over 270 women across Canada have gone through our programs. Um, I would say probably close to you know, 90% or more are still working in the industry. Uh, they have directed collectively or individually within that group um, 75 feature films and over 70% of those feature films have been funded by Telefilm Canada. So basically what we're aiming at is to elevate and support those women directors to, um, to get their projects through the pipeline and to, to, uh, to be recognized. And so uh, we're, we're run by a volunteer board of directors that's made up of uh, some of our um, original collective uh, uh, organizations uh, from ACTRA and um, and a board of alumni. So we are peer peer driven, peer peer run organization. So that's that's just a little thumbnail of, of what we what we get up to. And I'm one of the co-creators. Um, I came from the ACTRA side and I've been helping to guide the initiative from the, the very beginning as a producer and a mentor and executive producer of the feature films that go through our program now. And we have been very fortunate to be welcoming you to our festival for 10 years now. I believe this is number 10? Well, it's actually, uh, we started, I think, in 2008, Jen. So it's 12 oh. years now. It, time flies. I um, love it. We, we uh, had an, um, a little bit of uh, social benefit funding from, uh, from CTV. And we, we created this career advancement module, an outreach initiative that uh, connects us with the women's film festivals across Canada, St. John's being the first and female I, Leslie Ann uh, coming up and a Vancouver Fem Women in Film Festival as well. So. Yeah, I, I just, we'll get so much more into this uh, in a little bit, but it's a huge impact and a huge highlight for, for local creators and also everyone who joins us through the, the camp sessions every year. So again, I'm, I'm happy that we're able to do it for number 12 this year, even though <laughs> it's from afar. So yes, thank you so much, Carol. Uh, Carol, how about a little bit about you and uh, with Toronto? Uh, thank you, and thanks again uh, for having me here. Yes, I, I'm actually recently fairly new at WIF Toronto. I joined April of last year. Um, the organization itself was founded in 1984. Uh, and what a lot of people don't know about WIF Toronto is that we actually have two arms. We have the WIF Toronto, which is the not-for-profit, and we have the foundation for WIF, which is a charity. And it's through our charity that we receive donations that allow us to provide bursaries to allow individuals to take some of our professional development courses. Um, with financial assistance they may otherwise not have access to. Um, so with Toronto is, it's a member-based organization. Um, we do have two separate boards. We provide professional development and uh, training. We do networking, mentoring. We have one of the biggest mentorship programs in the country, if not the biggest, that I can talk a bit about later. Um, and our real core values are engaging, empowering, and educating. Um, and we're really, we, we launched a new logo this year. We put out a commitment to have at least 50% of our mentees in this year's program be from the Black, Indigenous, people of color um, communities to help really make sure that we are being inclusive and diverse with not just our members, but the industry as a whole. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and Tracy is part of this. Um, coming out of a trip last fall and as soon as COVID hit in March, we started a collective with the other chapters in WIFT, uh, of, in, of WIFT in Canada with Women in View, and we started WIFT Canada. And we've been doing yes. um, online programming 
and um, we just got some funding thanks to the CMF. So we will be continuing to do that right through to March next year, which we're all thrilled about. Awesome. Yes, yeah, what a great, now especially the fact that that was formed during such a such a time that we're <laughs> that we're in right now is is amazing. Congratulations for that. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, and Ella, welcome. Hello, hello. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Ella, the founding director of Black Women Film Canada. We're in our fourth year as a rising collective, soon to be not for profit, and we support the development of Black women filmmakers, um, the content creators, media artists. Um, <clears throat> And I was, I mean, this was really created to um, support the development of black women filmmakers, um, which is, you know, when we, we brought our first group of folks together and we had 40 people, um, you know, some really well-known names, some emerging people said, wow, there's 40 filmmakers and, and there's more than that. There's a lot more. And, um, so since then we've rolled out some really transformative leadership programs. So rather than trying to replicate what a lot of the folks here are doing, which is such incredible work, um, we've actually been, we've been creating other models that really serve uh, black women filmmakers and media artists. And um, so we provide leadership development, we provide uh, mentorship. Um, we take folks through festivals like TIFF, um, and actually create like a unique industry development program within their festival experience. Um, we're about creating access and we love working with people. And so I say that even to the panel that we should talk more and it's great to see you again. Um, and our partners have been the Canadian Film Center, CBC, uh, the National Film Board, folks like that. So we really work in concert with the industry to ensure that what we're creating is at a really high professional level. And we see that the people going through our programs, which also include master classes, and um, we're out, gonna be providing a lot new, like some really fun new shadowing opportunities with various production companies as well. Um, what we're seeing is that when people come through our programs, that we we serve as a catalyst. So then we see them actually working with these industry partners, collaborating with each other, creating their own projects, um, or sometimes simply believing in themselves. So like we've gotten some really amazing shout outs from filmmakers who have been in the TIFF Film Festival this year and said, oh, but hadn't been for our program, like picking up my script last year or two years ago, I might not have made this film, but because of the support that we showed and the solidarity around their work, we're seeing more, more black women have the confidence to put themselves out there and really believe in their um, work. And so, yeah, we're, we're a national organization. We serve people across Canada and um, we work at a grassroots level um, with the goal to really grow and thrive. And so, um, and that's a little bit about us. And the, I think the last thing I would add is people often come to us going, oh, I wanna hire black women, like, where are they? because a lot of people act as though we don't exist. And so we have a growing industry um, PDF. We're not interested in replicating like what other folks are doing. This is just simply for people who, they want a list of names and contacts um, to hire as directors, producers, editors, writers. And we have this easy, easily downloadable PDF that's always growing. So we're just looking, we're constantly branching out and looking for ways to um, really um, put black women filmmakers in the in the spotlight yeah congratulations I, i've used your pdfs like it's it, everything you're doing is just i mean with everyone here so exciting great to hear i'm, I'm fanning over all of you i was <laughs> so excited <laughs> thank you very much uh leslie welcome hi how are you it's nice to be in the space so I'm the um, founder and the executive director of the Female Eye Film Festival. And the inaugural, our inaugural event actually took place in 2001. So we're celebrating our 19th edition in March, um, but we actually, it's our 20th year. And the festival, I felt compelled to produce the festival um, in 2001 because I was coming out of the festival circuit as I'm also a filmmaker and um, there were no women directors. So we, I would go to international film festivals and there was maybe three or five of us among 30 male directors. 
And that raised a question for me. I wanted to know if that was because women's films weren't getting um, selected and showcased or weren't there any women directors, you know? So that was sort of the big question for me. And, and it was quickly answered in the first year, we presented 42 films and 26 of those films were from local Toronto based independent filmmakers. So there was a community and we didn't have a long time running in. So it was really a local, um, we reached a little bit out into the, the world, but we hadn't really firmly established ourselves. So now we are, um, you know, we are competitive. We have a robust industry initiatives program. We have a really great script development program that's been going since 2008 and 2009. Um, because I come from uh, an education background as an artist and integrated arts educator. Um, I felt compelled to encourage young women, youth to pursue filmmaking as directors. And we launched the Young Filmmaker Development Workshop using Super 8 cameras. So the artists, um, the, the youth were completely in charge of um, the vision for their project, the shooting it, editing it. They learned how to cut on Final Cut Pro. We worked with high school students. We worked with indigenous youth. I work in the community in Toronto. And we produced to date 46 short films. Um, 26 of those were directed by indigenous youth from the Sioux, from Javasing First Nation, from Toronto through the Jarvis Indigenous Learning Center. Um, so I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of that program. And in recent years, I've been doing a lot of curatorial work for foreign sister film festivals in Armenia. I'm praying for them. Um, Turkey, The Flying Broom, uh, Femcini in Chile, um, Beirut, anyway. So um, trying to showcase specifically films directed by Canadian women directors who've come through the female eye. Um, and curating Canadian uh, film programs for these foreign sister film festivals abroad. Yeah. Amazing, thank you so, so much. And last but not least, Tracy Deer, welcome. Thank you. So I'm here with Women in View. I'm chair of the board. It's been a few years that I've been with them. Um, where our work is really on strengthening gender representation and diversity within our, our industry, both on screen and behind screen. Um, we were founded in 2011 um, out of a conference that really identified the dismal numbers we had um, in terms of being hired in our, in our industry. So I think like our crown jewel of our organization is our reports. Uh, we've been, we've had five reports uh, published up until this point. It's called the on screen report and you could find them all on our website. And that was really just digging into the numbers of um, projects funded by both CMF and Telefilm and who, who was being hired, where was the money going, how many women were working. And with those reports and having those numbers to point to, um, we have seen over the last few years, um, the commitments made by CBC, Telefilm, CMF, the CRTC, um, and we have a new report coming out uh, in the next maybe two months, I'll say. We have a new report coming out and, and the numbers are moving. They're, they're, they are, it's, it's, it's very exciting. It's very exciting, ladies. Um, <laughs> but we also, but these reports also show where we are still lacking and where the work needs to, needs to still um, take place. But what's, what I find really exciting about these reports is that we women are the ones making the changes. Women are hiring women. Um, but, but men, you're doing a great job too. You know, you, you are as well. Uh, but really like the sisterhood is strong and I, I, I'm excited to see what's next. Um, we also do have programs uh, like Carol mentioned, um, you know, there's so many programs for emerging and to train and to mentor and um, and they're all wonderful. But we identified years ago that there is a bit of a plateau 
and you're not breaking into the next level. And so we do have a few programs that we've also, we also run to help take that level and push them to and get the exposure and the promotion that they need to be hired. So those are the two prongs, the two pronged approach that, that we have going on right now. And we've been very fortunate at, at St. John's International Women's Film Festival to have the reports for, for several years launched and shared as you know one of the, the real highlights, I'll say, of Festival Week every year. We also look to the report. It's just such a, a fantastic resource and something that you know, I, I well, this year, for example, the 29 report was released last May. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, and that one, too, showed, you know, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, it, some numbers are changing, but really highlighting where we are, and where we need to be. I believe the last report had um, women writers, directors and cinematographers uh, they represent 25% of the creative roles in those publicly funded uh, Canadian film and TV. So I'm really looking forward to seeing where we are now with the latest report and where we are moving forward. Um, and to add a little bit about um, our festival, uh, for anyone who isn't far too familiar, uh, this is our 31st annual edition. So we are the longest running women's film festival in Canada and one of the longest running in the world. Um, and we also have, uh, I find it very easy to brag about our festival because many people like yourselves and so many volunteer and staff and filmmakers over three decades have just made this festival a, a true gem of um, advocating for women in film, both in front of the camera and behind, um, and from all of our programs that operate year round. And it's really interesting because here in Newfoundland Labrador, we are also the biggest film festival. So it's a very unique uh, environment here to have a women's film festival as a leader of the industry. Um, and so as such, it's wonderful to see all of the really unique programming that's existing all across the country from leaders like yourselves. And so part of this conversation first kind of stemmed from several years ago, lots of uh, players in the industry had decided, okay, let's actually set some targets, let's set some goals. So we had aimed for, let's look at 50-50 gender parity by 2020. We're here in 2020, <laughs> obviously parity has not been has met, uh, but we have seen a lot of good changes. And I'd love to look at from all of your different perspectives, you know, we have a lot of work to do and we have a lot of progress that we want to make, but which positive things have come within this, you know, the past five years? What kind of positive things are you seeing with regards to uh, changing priorities and how we can really work to support women in our industry? Any thoughts there? I have one thought. I have a few thoughts, but I have one um, observation that we've certainly made at the Female Eye, and that is in the early years of the festival, I would say for the really the first decade, um, we would see these great films from unknown women directors who most often were also the writers and producers. I mean, women wear many hats in their productions to this date. Um, and then we wouldn't see them again. They would kind of disappear. Um, and I always wondered what happened to them. And I realized um, that the industry just, what, it wasn't sustainable. It wasn't a sustainable career choice. Um, I think their aspiration was to be directors um, of film. And so now what I've noticed in, in more recent years is we certainly are seeing, um, you know, repeat offenders as it were. We're seeing women coming back um, with another short or they've produced, you know, they've been, you know, we've looked at five of their shorts and now they're coming back with a feature or a second feature. So that's really, really exciting to me. Um, is we're seeing actually career growth in the in the community. Um, so I'm really, I think that's a big shift. Certainly. Carol, you had to begin? Oh, yeah, I just, um, I wanted just to share a couple of, you know, broad observations. It's more that for me, um, 
I feel that our funding bodies and agencies are listening, that there's, mm. there's a willingness now after many years beating on the door and so much work from uh, advocacy um, arms of Women in Film in Vancouver and Women in View, which grew out of that uh, initial BC kind of charge of, okay, what's actually happening in our industry, getting grappling with an, an, um, the lack of data and the lack of uh, kind of consistent collection of data. So what's positive now is that, there's a pathway to actually collect data. There's a willingness to share that and um, an open ear, if you will, to finding solutions if the, if the pathway isn't really clear. So I, I think that those are really positive changes on the advocacy level. And I do agree with you, Leslie Ann, in terms of what I'm seeing, there are um, clearer pathways uh, that I'm seeing the the women directors or the directors going through our program and I should have said earlier that it's national in scope it's coast to coast um, almost a third are from the west a third from the east and you know a third from all over the smaller regions the smaller production centers if you will and so um, I'm seeing more movement in terms of uh, um, the the ability for women directors to have their films accessed and or, or funded, if you will, and um, an, an appetite for women led television series as well. I'm, I'm thinking about Trickster just coming out on, on uh, CBC, which premiered last night, Michelle Latimer is one of our alumni and, and, um, you know, when she came through the program, she was uh, definitely a, a talent and, and, and had the, uh, the, uh, the chops, but to watch her trajectory, for example, um, really advocating uh, in her own authentic voice throughout her career, that's what I'm finding really positive as well, is that there's a, a, a real confidence that Ella was talking about earlier, that confidence is, that, that um, may have been kind of fragile uh, at the beginning is translating into a confidence from the industry as well. It's slow, but it's, it, I, I'm seeing movement. It's the internal confidence is there and it's rising and the external confidence is there. And, and it, that confidence continuum was broken before. And now it's starting to mm -hmm. come together a little bit, just, just a little. Another thing I, I would add is, um... Uh, well, I, I think when I, I heard a really interesting uh, fact was that often when initiatives come up to support those who have less uh, like parity or whatever, um, that sometimes the folks who are really dominating the industry think, oh, well, someone else is taking care of it. And so I, I think it's really important, especially for guys who are watching this or male identified folks, to remember that even though we exist as organizations serving uh, this community that um, we actually really need allies who are very connected within the industry in order to make headway. Um, mm -hmm. It's still an issue, like that's still really key. And so um, the allies that we work with are, are the ones who also, it makes them feel more comfortable to bring on people that are new to their, their scope. Because as we know, the industry is very much who you know. And, um, you know, and if you're on a film with people who you're comfortable with and it's, and it's, you know, it's going to make money, you know, they're good at what they do, you're just going to go back to those same people. And so there was one um, male producer who I've recently been in contact with who I think is doing something that's really excellent. And he's realized that in order to diversify his basically, there's 250 people on this team and no one is black, or maybe there's one, right? And so there's very little diversity. And so what they've got, what they've decided to do is take pause and go, okay, well, how do we change this? And one of the things he realizes that he can't expect everyone to fall into the, the perfect cookie cutter um, vision of what it used to be. So they have to be able to see the, the variety of skills that someone holds. Um, and realize, okay, like they're actually a great fit for this role, but we might have to bring them along a bit here, here, and here to set them up for success. Mm -hmm. And I, I, oops, sorry. And and uh, I, I would also add that 
within that, um, when, when I'm meeting up and coming black women filmmakers and writers and whatever, often I think in the back of a lot of people's minds, they think, oh, there's no space for me to do that. No one would hire me to do that. Um, no one wants that story or, or there's the feeling of tokenism. Like there's already one person representing this community. And so I think it's also really exciting when someone has brought in the real, they're, they, they're aware that they have what it takes, um, but then there's actually a system in place in these productions, in these organizations that's going, okay, how do we make sure that we set them up for success? It's not just about letting someone in the door in a system that's already kind of broken and very in exclusive, right? Like that's not welcoming. It wouldn't feel welcoming if you came to someone's party and they let you in the door, but then they ignored you and didn't give you a glass of wine. You know, like it's like, it's really basic, but it's essentially what we do in, in this industry. So, mm -hmm. so it's really about like, if you say you want parity, if you say you want diversity, what are you doing internally to make it so that those folks are thriving and not the, you know, not the ones who are just shifting their way out because it's just not comfortable for them to even be in that space, you know, which is why a lot of black women uh, directors come at it later in life. You know, you see the Ava Davernays, she started at 30. It's like you have, like, also with our emerging programs, we have to remember that some people are emerging much later on because they had to deal with so many systems of oppression to finally realize that their voice mass mattered, you know? Um, so anyway, those are just like some things that come to mind around that question. It, it kind of speaks to the, uh, uh, sorry, Tracy, you go. Yeah, because it's, it's right off of what Ella's talking about. I'd love to jump in here. Um, so two things. Um, one, we have seen that public commitments and then accountability to those commitments have made a big difference. Um, you'll see in the coming report, there are a few categories where we have hit parity and that's amazing. Um, but what you'll also see and what we did show in the previous report, which covered 2014 to 2017, it was the first time we, we actually looked at the numbers of women and broke it down um, and identified indigenous and women of color. Uh, and nobody had been recording those numbers um, as of yet. They couldn't provide that to us. So we just went ahead and, and figured it out. And we did the same thing again for this current report, which covers 2017 to 2019. And unfortunately, while we are hitting parity in a few categories, and I think numbers overall for women are up, numbers for indigenous women and women of color are not at all. So I think this next round, now that, now that our sisters have heard the call, women are hiring women, that is happening. Um, and we have men who are, who are also answering the call and hiring us. But I think the next call and the next round of commitments have to be to ensure that all of the sisters are, are rising. And so that next call is, I think, to women saying, amazing job, like we, we, we are doing it, we're helping each other. And now we have to help our, these sisters who, who need, we like, and I'm speaking for myself and my people here, we need um, the, the assistance as well now, we need that focus. So I would like to see commitments shift to be much more specific to ensure that you know, the content we're producing um, represents the perspectives and the experiences of this country. Um, for the longest time, it was male and it was white. And now, yes, as women, we, we're having a bigger share of that as it should be. Um, but, but there's also, there's various diverse experiences in this country that also need to be uh, weighing in to, to to, to the media that we put forward. As a little girl, I grew up never seeing my perspective, never seeing myself on TV. And it really did have an impact on my self-worth and my ability to dream about my future. So it is so, so, so important what we put on our screens. I, I would like to follow that. I think that one of the things that I've certainly, I think we've all noticed, and it's, it's part of this is that we are, we're so accustomed to seeing story uh, told through the lens of a male because it really was uh, the bastion of the old boys club for forever. And I think um, it was the, 
a real important part of what St. John's, Vancouver, all of us are doing is that we are giving a space to show work and story from a from a, a femme centric perspective. And um, I think an exciting, uh, an exciting uh, outcome of that has been, you know, the whole um, uh, sort of stereotype of chick flick. So if a woman writes and directs a film, it's a chick flick. And, you know, whatever that means, it means that women are creating content for women audience, for female audiences. And that is not true. That has never been true. And so the more we can move the work into the mainstream, introduce the work to wider communities and, and kind of, we worked really hard on that. Um, the female eye was to dispel that myth that just because a, a woman, um, however, uh, creates, writes, directs a film that it's, she's doing it for a female audience. And it would be like saying that men create films for male audience. I mean, it's ridiculous. So I just wanted to speak to the climate of change and also on set, the more we see women directing and we, the more we see women actively working in, in strategic roles as key creatives, we're also um, educating the community, the film community that women have uh, their own way of working. We, we bring different skill sets to the set. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that. Do you, I'm wondering if you all feel the same way. Um, I think it's, well, it's about it, like you just diversify ideas, you know, like I, I don't want to say women bring a different skill set per se. Like sometimes you're just a badass cinematographer and yeah. by inviting other perspectives, you're just going to get more badass cinematographers and camera people on your team. Um, because sometimes when we start to go like women are bringing something different, even though I, I think in, a, in actual fact, it's that everyone is bringing something different every time they come to the table. Um, and that it's, it's, it's essential and, and like, it's only going to make things better. But I would also add that for that to work, folks actually have to figure out, oh, okay. Like if we're, we're bringing in different people, um, how, how are we making space for them? Like how, you know, like if someone's shadowing, how are we, um, there's a program out there right now that uh, someone gave the, the perspective that they were, they wish they would have reverse shadowing. So reverse mentorship where those people would come on their sets and support them as opposed to being put into sets that are currently totally inaccessible um, mm -hmm. to that individual. Like they one day will have access to that much money for these large productions but in actual fact what they need is that those resources on their productions you know and so that's how we also really start to see those shifts um and and i i totally agree on the the, the female perspective it's hilarious because i've always had a dream of like uh filming fantasy and action like it's just one of those things but i've all, i've just set that aside i'm like i got other things on my plate i'm a mom like it's good I, i'm doing other great creative projects but i just met another person another black mother who said you know my five-year goal is that i'm going to be in la shooting a major action film and and I was just like, yes, I will live vicariously through you. Um, <laughs> but my point is that we don't see a lot of that. I would say within that industry, there's a fear of putting women at the helm. I only know of a few of them. And in those situations, you would actually need to shadow and bring someone up. You'd have to just go, guys, she's here, she's sticking around, and we're going to support her to being incredibly successful in this realm. You know. I love that concept of the reverse shadowing because I think one thing that oh, yeah. all of our organizations are doing and something that's so important is mentorship and I love that hearing of the different levels are we looking at emerging artists are we looking at mid-career are we looking at um, really when we try to look at our industry in parity with an intersectional lens too it's who's missing you know who's here but who's missing and why and how can mm -hmm. we make that space um, and I think you know that is something that I find very exciting. The culture is moving once we have these conversations more so like how can we actually do that and how can we do that with, you know, comes down to funding, funding <laughs> over and over again uh, and mentorship and, you know, the role of festivals and, and 
you know, people who are going to be advocating for, for new careers. Because, you know, as you all say, the, how do we share diverse stories? And if we think of our country that truly reflect life everywhere, you know, it just makes such a stronger, um, we always celebrate our culture and our identity here and have we really broaden that. And I guess with that being said, what do you think are some of the steps of how we can make open up that industry? We're, we're talking 50, 50, but let's crack that open and see what else that really means. Because I don't want to just be, you know, that ticking boxes. Great. We've got 50, 50, but what does that really mean? And, and honestly, like, equity is not 50, 50, right? That's equality. Equity is not 50, 50, you know, like if you want to actually see change, it's not 50, 50. I, I, I was just listening, I, I like, I don't normally say that, but I was like, wait a second, <laughs> because also we want more, you know, it's not even more. more, it's like, where do you put the 50, 50? Usually the, the 50% is down here as far as like levels of seniority. And then the higher seniority, the people making the biggest decisions are still within that dominant bracket. You know what I mean? So it's actually, you probably have more of a 60, 40, like if you actually want to put people who are BIPOC and people who are women in really through the system, um, you know, I, I think there's another way. Uh, anyway, just putting that there, 60, 40. I want, to hear from, I want to hear from Karen, but I do want to jump in on this topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll wait my turn, Karen, and give you a chance to, to weigh in on the positives that you're seeing. And But I, I do want to weigh in on this inclusivity piece as well. Sure, uh, thank you, Carol. Yeah, I was just going to say, it kind of goes back to uh, Gina Davis starting her Gina Davis Institute um, is what I was going to comment from Ella and Tracy's comments of C. Jane. And the whole reason she started that institute was when her daughter was young and was watching TV. And she always jokes, you know, you grow up with Dick and Jane. And she's like, I was seeing a lot of Dick and I wasn't seeing a lot of Jane. <laughs> and so she started this, the Jane Institute. And it's all about C. Jane. And if you can see yourself, you can be it. And it's that that young girl or young boy, gay boy, all gender, any gender, all colors, if they can see themselves on TV, then they can be it. And that goes back to what Tracy was saying when she was young, she never saw herself on TV. So it, it wasn't something she thought she could be, I guess, I'm, I don't, not to put words in your mouth. But that's also what came out of the last on-screen report was, yes, our numbers are moving and we're doing better. And it's been proven that women hire more women and black women hire more black women and indigenous people hire more indigenous. And you, we were seeing that, but those numbers are still not high enough. And I guess we're gonna see that in the next report. To your point, as far as the sisterhood goes, how do we continue to build on that and make sure we're supporting? And I can just say through our with Toronto mentorship program, you know, with our commitment for our mentees this year, we couldn't, and I hate to use the word couldn't, but we really couldn't do a 50% commitment to the mentors because we don't have enough people. It's a volunteer uh, position. We don't have enough people from the Black, Indigenous, pe persons of color community that are willing to donate their time, probably because they're being asked to do too many things all at the same time, or they're not there. So what we need to do is educate and elevate and empower the younger generation to become those mentors in the next few years. Yeah. And you know our WIFT Connect mentorship program that's funded through Telefilm, we're pairing sometimes over 50 people and it's a one-on-one -on -one program over six months. And it's for behind the camera, in front of the camera, it's the C-suite, it's the junior line producers. We're trying to do sort of the gamut so that we are seeing those numbers increase in all areas of the industry. And I just want to plug that because our application process is open right now. And we have kind of done this little side thing that for anyone that comes from the Black Indigenous Persons of Color community, you it is a free application to apply. You are supposed to be a member with Toronto, but we are taking applications from anyone right now. And if you get into the program, then we were going to ask you to become a member and we can provide a discount for you to do that. Sorry, I had to plug. Yeah. <laughs> So I just have to jump in on this um, as well. Uh, our, our board of directors or our um, organization had our AGM this year and the, the conversation was, was uh, around um, what's working for you, you know, it's COVID, what are, the, what are your concerns? And um, the, 
the topic ranged from concerns about gender parity going down to the bottom of the list uh, in the time of COVID, but also what rose up in the conversation was um, the, the inclusivity piece and, and how we can, as an organization, be more mindful and more proactive uh, in, in how we um, function in that space and how we're supportive in that space. So our board of directors took it upon themselves to um, do some uh, personal training, uh, anti-oppression training and uh, research. And we've come up with um, at least four action items that will be uh, part of our rollout of, um, of what we're doing. So we immediately, um, because of COVID, but, but it also um, answers the, um, the systemic uh, access question, we waived all of our application and tuition fees. That's just across the board. You don't have to give a, a reason. You can waive them or you can pay what you can as a donation because we, you know, that's a, a source of revenue for a very tiny nonprofit. So we, we didn't want to say, you know, we won't accept uh, donations, but by and large, a waiver for everybody. Um, our board has uh, committed to minimum 33%, a third of our um, leadership, our juries. Our, our um, participants uh, will be um, from diverse uh, backgrounds. And so that's, that's another piece of it, um, that leadership, that, you know, who's making the decisions, the, the, the peer juries who are uh, bringing uh, the, um, the new crop of, of participants into our, our programs. Um, so, so those are just a few of the things that we're up to. And we, we also embedded um, anti-oppression, anti-racism in our health and safety policy as well, and, and Indigenous land recognition and recognition of our, um, our space as settlers. And one of the things that I wanted to acknowledge is an intention of creating a safe space. And as a settler, as a person who has lived a life of privilege, uh, as, a, as a white identifying individual, um, I have to also acknowledge there was there's been an overwhelming um, education or an awakening on a personal level of the of the micro privileges or or larger privileges that we've we've um, been privy to or that we've we've had in the context of of the gender work that we're doing and and so um, I'm really grateful to the the women who've gone through our program for the the thoughtful feedback that they've provided over the years and you know in a, in some cases it, we we partner with the BAMP Center uh, the you know for the first um, half of our uh, existence from the beginning to about um, 2013 I think was the last large program, our production program, and then 2016, I think was the, the last time we actually um, ran a program with the BAMP Center. But over the course of the BAMP Center's existence, th that institution has had um, an Indigenous element, uh, Aboriginal arts program, and um, very strong um, connection with the community there. And so our Indigenous participants would avail themselves of that support as well. And it was sort of automatic that that happened. And so I, you know, it's really important to recognize that our intentions are to be inclusive, but when our lens or our personal experience isn't the same as our racialized participants, I think it's incumbent upon us to educate ourselves and, and be mindful of that gap in experience, even though we've had our own uh, oppressive experiences as women, uh, you know, in a in a male dominant and patriarchal system, there there's a lot of work to be done on all levels, and mm -hmm. that's something I I'm really grateful for the space to do right now, and and so that that policy work is coming out to our alumni very shortly, and. Uh, um, 
and I'm, I'm really proud that um, our board now is 40% uh, um, you know, a diverse um, participants, and leaders in our, in our board direction. So that's, that's a kind of a, um, and, it, and it has shifted and changed over the years, like 27% of our alumni are from the indigenous black and um, women of color uh, communities. And so that's not so bad, but we can do better. That's, I just wanted to put that out there. I, I appreciate that um, because one of the, the comments made a little while back, there was, there, there was a certain year, I can't remember what year, where it was all like, share the screen, gender parity, like it was like this year where there was a re, like a lot of real surge. It was really beautiful. Um, and one of the things that I was seeing is that it felt like um, when what, what we see in the Oscars and you know Hollywood, da, 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 but also on the Canadian side, is it, um, I, I said to someone, it sort of feels like um, the film industry is going through just like first wave feminism. So, you know, there was even that thing where it's like diversity also includes women, just when, you know, like, like we have BIPOC folks and women, you know, like that has been something we see a little bit. And, um, and what I noticed is that the, the first wave, the first wave feminism of film was, was primarily white women who were already in, in, in the mix, essentially, um, who have been fighting probably for years to get in there. So don't get me wrong. There's no um, picnic. Yeah. yeah, but but it's a very different experience for a black person and a black woman. And like, so to start looking at multiracial feminist um, ways of including people is really great. And I appreciate like the examples that you give because um, it it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. Like I, in one sense, like a lot of people of color are used to having to fend for themselves, but it's interesting how on these sets, it's, it's um, because it's been supported to be one way for so long, it, you know, you're still, you're still a very tokenized individual. Um, folks like uh, Sasha Lee Henry are now saying, if I am the only black person, um, I don't care if there's other women on the set, but if I'm the only black person on this set, I will be walking off your set. I don't care if it messes with your production. And that's a big, you know, that's like someone with big boots who's like, no, I'm done, you know? And there's other folks who are happy to get in there and be like, yes. Um, but I, I, yeah, I really think there are two different conversations that are op often happening. And it's great when, um, you know, I can look at my own privilege at like from someone who's light skin um, and how we've even done that in the industry, how like light skin people are more palatable, et cetera, et cetera. So, it is, it is great to do that work. And I think the more that our leaders are doing the work to understand these nuances, the more we'll see change in the industry. It can't just come from, you know, creating a lot of internship and mentorship programs and hoping that these young POC folks are somehow gonna just make it in these environments that are still, like you said, uh, still quite unsafe. I love that, Ellen. I think that brings up, um, Another question I'd love to hear all of your perspectives from as industry leaders, which you all are, what do you think when you're looking at that next generation of, you know, there's a lot of change happening and how we're going to continue this work going forward, what kind of advice would you give or what kind of changes would you love to see from um, the organizations and festivals and, and whatnot, everyone who's running this, what our priorities really should be and what kind of advice you wish that you had to have known when you started to do the work that you do now? I think, but I, I can speak for the, for the female eye film festival, but I think all festivals, whether they're women film festivals or wherever they are in the world, I think that we all need to be mindful. Um, I mean, we've certainly been mindful of how people identify as persons forever. But I think in terms of now previewing films, um, I've directed, our film programmers to really be mindful of uh, racialized minorities to, to actually we have a point system for rating films. So we're actually giving points, additional points um, to, to people who are underrepresented. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's really important. And that followed a conversation I had with you, Carol, not too long ago. So I think we all need to be mindful 
I just want to go back to something when I was talking about women being different, it's a slippery slope to say women, you know, we bring a different kind of sensibility to, to set, but it really was fueled by so many conversations with, with women directors from Carrie Scoglin to Gail Harvey to, I mean, some very well established, um, you know, women directors in, and it was that they, they felt that, you know, I don't know if this is outdated, but they felt that that their male counterparts could come onto set and have a fit, have a temper tantrum, throw a chair, yell at their DP, um, swear and hoot and howl. And if a woman, and I think it was Carrie Scoglin who said this to me, she said, if I go on set and I show any, any, uh, there's any second guessing or I become emotional on any level, my crew will lose confidence in me. They will say, I am a hysterical, uh, you know, they can't depend on me. I am not, um, you know, I'm not together. Uh, there's something wrong with me. I'm emotionally unstable. And I think that I, I was really trying to speak to that is that we all, you know, every person has a different way of working with actors and a different way of working with crew. And some people are more empathetic and I'm not saying that men aren't. I'm just saying that I think because of the way we're raised and because of what we've lived through, we have a different um, level of sense. I don't know. I have to be so careful whenever I speak to it because I don't want to relegate women to this thing that they are different. But it, 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 we need more women in the space, uh, all levels of crew, all levels of everything. Um, because it just, it, it introduces something that isn't often familiar, um, and that isn't commonplace, that isn't the norm. Am I saying that correctly? I just wanted to clarify that. What you're, what you're, what you're referring to, Leslie Ann, is an ongoing unconscious bias in society. Um, towards the patriarchy, towards um, male leadership, the big man theory, somebody who's tall, out in front, who has a certain way of leading. And, and there's still an unconscious bias towards that. And it, and it stems from our primitive brain in being in survival mode. And, and so what, what um, I think our work to answer Jen's question of, you know, what advice, what work we need to do is to continue to hold space mm -hmm. um, it, because there's always a chance of washing backwards. There's always a chance of, of uh, one step forward, two steps back. Yes. So while we're, a, a lot of us around on, in this uh, conversation are founders um, and have been at it for a long time. I think it's um, it's important to recognize the fatigue that goes with this, but the, also the need to continue to hold the space and to to value that genuine connection that we have with each other as a feminist way of working. It's so energizing to be in this space with all of you, because I don't feel alone in my you know way out here on the coast, even though I'm reaching a, on a national level it's sometimes very lonely work that we're doing. And so I think holding that space for ourselves, for the people that we're um, uh, serving, but also holding it for each other and cheering for each other because we're, th th that's the other thing I wanted to acknowledge, Jen, in this conversation is there's such diversity in the organizations across the country there's this is only a small sampling of all the work that's uh, being done coast to coast to coast and and so i think we need to search for each other and support each other and cheer for each other because no one person or no one organization can do all the work that we're talking about here and i i think that we need to listen to each other and support and and cheer for each other so we can all grow stronger you know, that's that's sort of what I would I would put forward for people, you know, listening to this conversation today is that there's there's room for everybody. Um, and we all have unique ways, entry points in different ways of participating. I think mm -hmm. it's it's incumbent upon us as leaders to recognize that. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. And I, I also actually I want to ask Tracy a question. Um, 
one of the things I was going to say was, and when you're in more leadership roles on set, you have the opportunity to kind of run the set differently. And I was curious to know, like, you know, as a director, Tracy, is there anything that you do differently when, when you get to be in a leadership role on set? So this is exactly what I wanted to speak up about um, off of what uh, Leslie Ann and Carol have, have just spoken about. Um, I, f I feel, cause I've been working now for 20 years and I, so I, I feel like our, all of us, a lot of our work has been to try to get into the status quo. And so, and so often that is about how to do this job like a man to be respected like a man is respected. And so my advice for those coming up and what I now do is I'm, I'm creating my own space. I'm no longer trying to be like a man. And I actually, I'm very, I'm sensitive and I'm emotional. And that is, that is what makes me the director I am. And so for me, my sets are emotional friendly. Um, it is a high stress, high stress time. We're all passionately devoting ourselves to things. If, if you make a mistake or you get stressed, like my, my script supervisor needs to take a moment for a cry. I get it. You know, there are times <laughs> I need to as well. So, but I remember coming up where that was like, never do that. Don't ever cry. Don't ever show weakness. Um, and then if I did and I'd hide, I'd have a fellow woman come around and, and berate me to say, you better stop that right now because this, this looks bad on all of us. So I'd be like, oh God. Um, and that, I'm so against that. Um, so being in a leadership position in that way is wonderful because for me, it's about breaking that status quo and we should all be creating in, in ways that are right for us. So it's fine if you're a woman and you don't and you don't want to cry on set and you're a man and you don't want to cry on set but if you are in the middle of filming a traumatic recreation of something that came from your childhood and you need to step off and take a few breaths and have a cry and then you know your DOP comes up and gives you a hug and says I'm right here for you and she's tearing up too I think that's a beautiful thing that we can celebrate so mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. moving forward, the more we can break that status quo and reshape, reshape the rules. Who decided on these rules anyway? Let's reshape what that is so that we right. all have a place and we're comfortable. And again, to come back to that safety question, up until now, like our sets haven't been safe. There's, <laughs> there's toxic masculinity, there's bullying, there's sexism. It, it's we need to change so that's what i advise everyone coming up did i freeze <laughs> no you're good i just want to i want to no? do a okay i, I want to do a shout out you to guys you guys froze for a second okay oh i want to shout out to nicole dorsey who was um on one of the panels last year um she she was uh, celebrated for black conflux her her debut feature and when she talked about um the process tracy she she too was had one of those moments and what, how she described it was she had to go off like just step aside and take a power cry it, and i love that term it was a power cry so she was harnessing it like allowing it to happen and and harnessing it because you know that's that's power it's, it's a part of the powerful. creation process it's a beautiful part of the creation process and so for us to try to deny it actually doesn't help the work yep yeah i agree oh well, and um, so yeah. unfortunately karen, oh karen oh. you're muted karen's just muted sorry i think it was brigitte from our um the WIFT Quebec FCTM and FCTMN, who said that uh, alone we go faster, but together we go stronger. And for our WIFT Canada with Women in View Collective. And I think it's so true. And I think one of the things that we as women are getting better at is recognizing that men have never looked at themselves as competition. They think there's always room for all of them in the same room. Whereas I don't think women have typically felt that way. It's you or me. 
And one of the things that came out of um, Maxine Bailey, who received the Jury Distinction Award at our With Crystals last year, and we quote this all the time is, we are not each other's competition. We are each other's cheerleaders or, 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 or champions. And I think that's a really important motto or saying that we have to continually address to each other and to ourselves. It's not, it's not whether it's gonna be you or me that makes it, it's that there is room for all of us at the table. And I think that the more work that we can do to work together, like even just the six of us and with the with Canada and, and the other festivals and other organizations, we are gonna help support each other. I, I know personally for with Toronto, we are working on in, uh, improving our relationship with so many organizations to help cross promote and support. What can we do that you're not doing? What are the what are we already providing that are your holes and what are you providing that's our holes so that collectively at the end of the day, we're all achieving the goal of helping to empower and educate and elevate people in the industry. And I echo that. If I can just say, I would say we need to, organizations have, we are all so siloed. And what's really beautiful, I think, with this movement forward is that we're becoming less siloed and we're joining hearts, hands, and minds in our efforts. Um, I think we're all, you know, moving in the same direction and it's a beautiful thing. I think that this is, unfortunately, we're, we're about out of time, um, but such a wonderful note to wrap up this conversation with, mm -hmm. and, and just looking, especially for everyone watching this as well, and all the other organizations who, you know, like Carol said, this is such a sample of amazing work that's happening uh, here, and I just want everyone to know that reach out to the people who are serving to represent you and to support you, you know? That's why the Women's Film Festival in St. John's is here. We are to serve all of our filmmakers. And so many of you have such beautiful, dynamic, powerful, really smart, innovative programming. And I just love the, the solidarity that we really do need to work closer together. And, uh, you know, it's just so exciting to, Let's champion one another. Let's hopefully be able to celebrate one another in person together soon. Um, and again, I'm just very grateful of all of your wonderful perspectives and work. And it's truly an honor to uh, have you all here. And I really value and admire you all. So thank you once again for joining us. And I hope that we can chat thank again. You. Thanks, Jim. Can, we, can I ask you, can we... Uh have our websites shared with uh, with the audience so that the audience mm -hmm. can get in touch with us. And then I'd also like to suggest that this is a to be continued conversation. A hundred percent. So once we'll have, um, when this is live, so for anyone who will be watching it, um, once our festival starts, we'll have everyone's organizations listed below. So please do follow them, support all of these amazing organizations. And if they can serve you, all these filmmakers, please do reach out because there's incredible work to, to really elevate everyone in our industry. So thank you. Okay, thank we'll you, lovely to meet you all. Fall in thank you, off. ladies. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Thank you.